Good evening, uh, and we're uh, here again, uh, having finished the pre-sanctified liturgy on this Friday evening, and um, just on the cusp of going into March, and uh, this, this early Pascha that we have this year. I was going to continue our discussion, which is unfolding slowly because we're going to do something quite in-depth about the problems of neo-Gnosticism in the Orthodox Church and the aerial toll houses. It's not the only problem of a neo-Gnosticism that has arisen, well, in the 20th century, but even slowly being reborn in our own time. And that is the Gnostic doctrine of the Divine Sophia, which we uh, had through the disciples of Solovyov. Uh, Solovyov had gone back to ancient Gnostic writings and found the discussions of the Divine Sophia uh, among those Gnostic writings and tried to turn it into some kind of a Christian doctrine, certainly without success. And um, Sergei Bulgakov, of course, carried that into Western Europe. And whilst people are trying to sort of uh, advance the ideas and philosophy of Sergei Bulgakov, as if he were an Orthodox theologian, which of course he was not. Uh, also, together with that, are trying to justify the Gnostic doctrine of the Divine Sophia. So you see, our quandary here is, has more than one facet to it. But I left you last in last broadcast in uh, <coughs> the uh, area of Mesopotamia, in the region of Nisibis, and uh, Azrahin, and, and uh, areas of the of the East, where there was a synthesis of Gnostic ideas based a little more on, say, Hindu ideas and Zoroastrianism and the ancient Chaldean astrology. <coughs> now, before we go back to Egypt, and we'll let Ammonia Sakas and his father take us back to Egypt a little later. I want to make a point, common in Gnosticism, that in the Gnostic systems there was always a kind of ascent through various spheres or levels or layers that had to be made. <clears throat> now from a Gnostic point of view, the flesh, the human body, the material body, could not make this kind of an ascent because the body was evil and the soul was trying to escape from the prison of the body. And uh, with, as with Buddhism and uh, Hinduism, uh, trying to escape totally and completely from material world. So this passing through these different levels or different spheres was the one common element that we want to look at a little bit this evening. Since the flesh could not, the human body, make such an ascent. The ascent could only be of the soul or totally spiritual without the body. Now this would lead some Gnostic uh, philosophers or people who'd been deeply affected by Gnosticism in later centuries to reinterpret the latter of divine ascent. As many of you know, St. John Climacus wrote the latter of divine ascent as a guide for monastics struggling in this life to ascend toward paradise through in this life, through their struggle in this life. <clears throat> now, the icon of the latter depicts exactly that, the monastic struggle in this life to ascend toward paradise. But from a Gnostic point of view, the icon of the latter had to be the soul after death because the human body cannot ascend and cannot enter into paradise, the flesh being evil and opposed to the spirit. So they transmuted, or really perverted, the, un the understanding of the latter of divine ascent into an ascent of the soul alone, and that of course could have been done only after death. And so in twisting and turning and perverting this teaching of St. John Climacus, they came up with the idea that the latter represents their aerial toll houses. Mm -hmm. 
and uh, that the, the soul is being tried and uh, condemned, judged literally by the demons after the departure of the soul from the body. And <clears throat> again we have this sort of shocking idea. You have Christ at the top of the ladder and demons were able to prevent Christ from being able to judge the souls by not allowing them to reach his throne where the only proper and honest judgment could possibly take place. So the demons are really undermining the authority and power of Jesus Christ and uh, preventing him from fulfilling that which is his and his alone to judge. Well, there is no other power to judge and all things both in heaven and on earth have been placed under Jesus Christ, not under the demons. Consequently, we uh, will see how these mythologies from Babylon and certain ideas from, I'd say, later Hinduism or Buddhism in informed some of the ideas of the Ariel Tollhouse cult that grew up within the Orthodox Church. There's another question that arose, and somebody asked me about it. <coughs> it seems that one of our neo-Gnostics in the Orthodox Church had written a scholarly book on the Christ of the Tao or the Tao of Christ, one or the other, that they weren't sure of the title, in which he proposes that up until him, no one had interpreted or translated the Tao Te Ching correctly, and that he had this revelation that Lao Tse had received a visitation from Christ before the Incarnation, and that Christ had revealed unto him his message in the coming Gospel. Now this is an example of the prelist or the enormous spiritual delusion and fantasy that occupies the minds of the Toll House cult and this neo-Gnosticism in the Orthodox Church. In the first place, Lao Tzu probably never existed. There's very little chance that he did. Lao Tzu is not a proper name. Lao Tzu simply means the old one, and could be old woman or old man or just old one. It is not a, an actual name. But in any case, we'll, we might discuss this a little later, but in myth, the mythology that grew up around Lao Tzu, he went to India and became the Buddha. I think Buddha was actually older than him, but in the mythology he goes to India and becomes the Buddha. And after that, he goes to Mesopotamia, to Persia, rather, and becomes Mani. Now, how would that... Um, mythology have grown up? And how would one perhaps find some vague Christian uh, things related in now later uh, Taoism? The Taoism after Taoism had become an organized religion. This was fairly late. Taoism went through uh, the time of the warring states and all went through at the time when it was a, a philosophy which considered political philosophy as well as personal morality and that sort of thing. But Manichaeism came all the way to China, encountered Taoism, and actually there was an interchange between Manichaeism and Taoism, and they had a bit of an influence on each other. So it's not surprising that uh, Taoist in China could refer to Mani, and that uh, someone might find some kind of Manichaean or Gnostic Christian references in later Taoism. So <clears throat> we'll continue our discussion now uh, a little bit later, and we'll, uh, we'll stop for now because we're about to run out of time. Thank you for listening, and please continue to send your questions, and God willing, tomorrow evening, I'll take up four or five of the questions that have been asked. Thank you, and God bless you.